Genome editing is a term most of you have probably heard of. It is often covered in media since it is a highly controversial topic. And no wonder through genome editing we can potentially generate designer babies which have certain characteristics such as a defined height or eye color. And just last year the first genetically engineered babies Lulu and Nana were born in China. These babies have been altered by a researcher to supposedly become HIV resistant. In this project couples were recruited who wanted to have a child and in order to participate in the experiment the man had to be infected with HIV but the woman had to be uninfected. When suitable couples were found, sperm and eggs were obtained and in vitro fertilization was conducted. Then CRISPR-Cas9 was used to allegedly mutate a gene called CCR5 in order to make children HIV resistant. This study was conducted secretly and it sparked worldwide outrage due to ethical concerns and a lack of safety. However, we broadly benefit from CRISPR-Cas9 in the laboratory today, but what is CRISPR-Cas9 and how can we use it? My name is Kevin Steinig and today we talk about CRISPR-Cas9 and how it might shape the future of molecular biology. CRISPR-Cas9 is a genome editing tool which means that it gives us the ability to change the DNA of organisms. This means that we can insert or delete for example genes at certain positions inside the genomes of bacteria, plants or animals. We also know other genome editing methods such as TAIL or sync finger nucleases but CRISPR-Cas9 is currently trending due to its low costs, easy application and specificity. So we will exclusively focus on this tool. CRISPR consists of two different terms, CRISPR or clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats and try to say this three times and Cas9 or CRISPR associated protein 9. Like many other tools, CRISPR-Cas9 was adapted from a natural system which is found in bacteria. You see, many bacteria have an immune system in order to recognize and fight off viruses which would otherwise destroy the cells. This immune system involves CRISPR arrays which are small segments inside the genomes of the bacteria and Cas proteins. After being infected by a virus, the bacteria snips out parts of the virus DNA and incorporates it into the CRISPR locus. If the same or very similar virus now attacks the cell again, then the bacteria can use RNA from the CRISPR locus and Cas9 proteins in order to destroy the virus. The important part here is that CRISPR sequences lead to the recognition of the same or very similar virus sequences. This system has been adapted and is now used in a laboratory. We can just use small RNAs called guide RNAs and Cas9 proteins in order to make cuts in defined regions of genomes. After we've done this, the cell's own repair machinery starts to recognize these DNA breaks and tries to seal them. For this process we can either deplete certain genes or we can introduce new genes by providing additional sequences to the cells. To give you an example, using CRISPR-Cas9 we can introduce the gene encoding for the green fluorescent protein or GFP at the beginning of a gene X which leads to the production of a protein in a nucleus. GFP is a very important protein in molecular biology which, as the name suggests, exhibits bright green fluorescence. If we now integrate GFP next to the aforementioned gene, a fusion protein is produced which compromises GFP and protein X. Since we can see GFP in a microscope, we can now visualize and track the movement of protein X. And as you can imagine, there are now numerous different applications of CRISPR-Cas9 technology. CRISPR-Cas9 has already been used to effectively modify crops or to correct mutations in animal models who suffer from Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Furthermore, CRISPR-Cas9 is also used to engineer T-cells in immunotherapy in order to treat cancer. If you are interested in this topic, we've already covered it here. Since its development, CRISPR-Cas9 has further been developed to serve different purposes. We can for example alter the production of proteins without causing any damages to the DNA using a system called deficient Cas9 or DCAS9. Here DCAS9 is localized to the DNA by a guide RNA similar to what we've already seen but it does not provoke any double strand breaks. So you can compare that Cas9 to a sleepy student who shows up to a lecture but is not very active. However, we can now couple other proteins such as TAT1 to DCAS9 in order to activate or inactivate adjacent genes. In this manner, the phenotype of Fragile X syndrome has already been reversed in neurons and in animal models. 
Of course, there are many challenges remaining concerning CRISPR-Cas9 and all the other different genome editing tools. First of all, we need to talk about efficiency and precision. You see, there are different repair mechanisms in a cell and we cannot really control which one is activated after we cleave a certain DNA sequence using CRISPR-Cas9. It might be that we want to insert a gene such as GFP, but the DNA repair mechanisms do not favor that. Moreover, off-target effects might also occur if we use genome editing. As already mentioned, we use a guide RNA, which leads to the localization of Cas9 to a certain DNA sequence. Unfortunately, there are often very similar regions within the same genome, which leads to the localization of Cas9 to different spots, meaning that we have unwanted DNA double stone breaks. As a consequence, further mutations might be introduced to the genome, which is not very dramatic if we work with cell lines, but imagine that we try to cure a patient who suffers from a genetic disease. Last year, I attended a lecture given by one of the pioneers of CRISPR-Cas9 editing, Jennifer Doughton at the Royal Society, and her data clearly shows that we still struggle with off-target effects. Moreover, we need to find efficient ways to deliver the DNA encoding for guide RNAs and CRISPR-Cas9 to certain cells. Although this is also not real an issue if we work with cells in a laboratory, we need to be very careful if we want to treat patients. Let's assume that we want to treat a patient who suffers from a genetic disease such as cystic fibrosis. In this case, we would like to replace a mutated form of the gene CFTR with a functional one. Since symptoms in cystic fibrosis mainly arise in the digestive tract and lungs, we only want to edit cells here. A lot of researchers are currently working on increasing the efficiency of gene therapies, which we've already discussed in this video here, but still a lot of research is yet to be conducted. And last but least, of course, there are ethical concerns if we start to edit the genomes of humans. If we use CRISPR-Cas9 technology in order to, for example, alter certain sequences in skin cells or neurons, there is still a very slight possibility that we also might alter sperm cells or eggs. As a result, we might cause mutations which are passed to the next generations. Nonetheless, CRISPR-Cas9 is a truly revolutionary tool in order to edit the genomes of organisms and cells. It is comparably easy to apply, cheap and specific. And if we further develop this technology, we might be one day able to cure genetic diseases. This approach would be especially interesting if we try to cure diseases which are caused by single mutations, such as sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis or hemophilia. But what do you think? How strongly should research concerning CRISPR-Cas9 technology be regulated? Should we only try to cure fatal diseases, meaning that they cause the death of the patient? Or should we also try to cure diseases which are harmful, but not deadly? Let me know in the comment section. And don't forget to like this video and also hit subscribe and the bell button if you're new here in order to stay informed about the latest discoveries in life sciences. And with that, I'll see ya.